of the Civil Rights Movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., tell us about his dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. In a world where history intertwines with destiny, we celebrate Black History Month. From the legends of the past who blazed trails to the pioneers of the present shaping our future and the visionaries yet to come. Tonight, we honor the resilience, creativity, and brilliance of black excellence. Good evening, I'm Anthony Ann Swan. It's been nearly six decades since an all-black high school in Baytown closed due to integration, but a local historian has worked tirelessly to make sure the historical school isn't forgotten. Our Denise Middleton takes us inside the traveling exhibit of George Washington Carver High School. Uh, that's me uh, when I was running a track uh, that was taken just before district meet in 1963. Jay Warren Singleton, a proud alumnus and track star of the only high school to ever serve the black community in Baytown, takes us down memory lane. The Carver High School uh, was a powerhouse in sports. The exhibit highlighting legendary coaches who helped the Panthers win eight state sports championships while also showcasing the school's history with articles, photos, and memorabilia. Yeah, our principal made sure that we were the best all-black high school in the state of Texas, and you can take that to the bank. It was a lot of pride and a lot of respect, and it's all because we had better discipline. A Carver graduate and Prairie View Interscholastic League Hall of Famer Kenneth St. Julian says he's honored to have left his mark at the high school, which dates back to the early 1920s. It was originally called Goose Creek School for Colors, but was later relocated and renamed after the black scientist and inventor George Washington Carver in 1941. We were taught by some people that were very educated and they were dedicated to teaching black kids not only educationally but lessons of life. And despite the lack of resources, students were still able to persevere, which is evident throughout the exhibit. From, you know, the throes of segregation, I'd say then, that you had people to rise up and do some significant things in their lives. When the school closed because of integration in 1967, Singleton says the school's history was buried. They tried to get rid of that history. You know, all of our records and stuff were thrown away, other than the fact that Peru Review had stuff archived. It's why Singleton worked so hard to get his hands on the collection you see today, including the dozens of awards he won, making history with the most industrial arts awards than anyone else at any school in Texas. Singleton also played a big role in getting a historical marker installed at the former site of George Washington Carver High School in 2011. His hope is to keep this black history alive to inspire others along the way. Denise Middleton, Fox 26 News. And black history is oftentimes confined to the books and chapters that sit on the shelves at any library near you. But one little girl in Third Ward brought the story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his dream to life. With tears in his eyes, Dr. King would reflect on the 60 years since his I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King would... The pride of Third Ward. Injustice anywhere. Begins at Blackshear Elementary School. Today, we have a desolate valley of segregation. And fourth grader Montoya Murray exemplifies those ideals. We have made justice a reality, and my children have carried on my legacy. And I am just amazed at the growth that has transpired in her life. Her, her voice has gotten so powerful. What are you reading? Who was Coretta Scott King? Since kindergarten, librarian Rhonda Miller Eaglin has had a front seat to Montoya's growth. She always did have this strong speaking voice, but now she has pizzazz with it. That talent hidden no more. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., tell us about his dream. It was on full display at the Foley MLK Jr. Oratory Competition. The topic was how would Dr. King reflect on the 60 years since his I Have a Dream speech. He would say, Mahalia, I kept on dreaming. In her speech, Montoya speaks from the perspective of Mahalia Jackson. Mahalia Jackson often sang for his speeches and marches, and she was the queen of gospel during his time. 
So I said I, pre I wanted to pretend to be Mahalia, and I did just that. <laughs> she then transitions to the perspective of Dr. King. Dr. King's last words would be to you. He would say, my life was worth sacrificing because I was fighting for you. You deserve the right to a free public education. She won. I was overwhelmed. I started crying. Montoya read articles, did research, and wrote her speech with Mrs. Eaglin, getting to school early to practice in the library, on her lunch breaks, and countless hours at home, and some big names took notice. I got texts from Viola Davis and Bernice King. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Martin Luther King's daughter reposted me on Instagram. That's big. It is big. Her recognition is warranted because Montoya truly embodies the dream. And as long as children like her are able to breathe new life into his words and live out his wildest dreams, Dr. King will always live on. Yes! They may have killed the dreamer, but couldn't kill the dream. Thank God! made it over. Ahead in this celebration of Black History Month, an enlightening debate on elements of black history currently under fire in America. And the story of a new sculpture honoring Congresswoman and Houston icon Barbara Jordan at the site of the post office that once bore her name. Art tells the story of people. In 1976, inspired by the African American theater movement and frustrated by the lack of roles for black actors, George Hawkins started the Black Ensemble Company. It later became the Ensemble Theater, the oldest and largest African-American theater in the Southwest.
Houston hosted its ninth annual citywide African American parade and symposium with the theme African Americans and the arts and celebrated the community's rich cultural heritage right here in Houston and beyond. And now we share parts of a tough conversation on what some say is the destruction of black history from fights over teaching critical race theory to book censorship and affirmative action. Here's the Isaiah Factors, Isaiah Carey. At the core of our American experiment is American racism. And until we are honestly willing to grapple with that endemic racism, the rest of this is nothing more than than uh, a lost lost cause. Kevin, your thoughts on that as an attorney and conservative here in this country and in Houston, your thoughts. Were we never intended to be a part of the process? I can't say we were never because history shows that there are there, when they were putting together the Constitution, there was big discussion on whether or not um, women or blacks would be a part of this, this process. And so you see the language is vague in our Constitution. They may say man, but they don't say white man. That, those were actually conversations that occurred because there were some people who felt like we can't do it now, but at some point we, we, we may be able to. So I, 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 totally get, I totally get what he's saying. Originally, we weren't part of the process. But at what point do we stop looking at that being the victims and we start taking our rightful place in the, in the country and what we've done? So, so the education, so when we ask ourselves, can we have books that have our faces in them, our stories represented? Can we uh, structurally uh, look at the way that racism has created racial disparities? That's not us engaged in trying to be Americans. Oh, I agree, and the but that's, state of Texas and the United States saying, no, I you agree. were never intended and, and, to be and, a part and, of this. And, and, some fascinating insights there. To hear the rest of that conversation and watch Isaiah's in-depth Black History Month special, download the Fox Local streaming app. In tribute to Congresswoman Barbara Jordan's legacy, a timeless sculpture now stands tall at Post Houston, embodying her unwavering commitment to justice and equality. Here's Fox 26's Chelsea Edwards. You may remember this as the old Barbara Jordan post office. We now know it as Post Houston, a place to dine, shop, and hang out. But Barbara Jordan is still being remembered here. Through this monument, I am Barbara Jordan. We have the artist here to tell us more about it. What does it mean for you to have been asked to do this project and to see it come to fruition? And it's a lot of gratitude. I mean, this is a huge honor. The politician and civil rights activist was the first African-American woman elected to the Texas Senate and the first Southern African-American woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. I spent a lot of time at the Texas Southern University Archive, looking at images, reading through speeches, coming from the city. You see Barbara, you're welcomed. And at the same time, she's holding the scales of justice. The bricks are from the old post office. The keys on her jacket represent the different honors that she received throughout her lifetime. Jordan grew up in Fifth Ward with two sisters, the eldest, now 91, Rose McGowan. She just was gifted with this voice that was so totally different and, and reverent and how it could get over. Uh, statements that needed to be made or actions that needed to be taken. The Post statue, only the latest in dedication to her sibling. In April of 2023, the Barbara Jordan building on the Texas Capitol grounds became the first ever state building to be named after a black woman. And in July, the Houston Public Library unveiled Houston's first monument dedicated to her at the Gregory School's African American History Research Center. No one is going to remember all of the accomplishments that, that were made. But to be able to know where they can go to observe, this is definitely a way of keeping um, the dream alive. Reporting from Post Houston, Chelsea Edwards, Fox 26 News. Standing on the shoulders of legends like Mae Jemison and Bernard Harris, Victor Glover's journey to space embodies the power of dreams and the importance of representation. We talk with him about history in the making when this celebration of Black History Month returns. And speaking of Bernard Harris Jr., in 1995, this University of Houston graduate became the first African American to walk in space. What may define him best, though, is the Harris Foundation created in 1998 to support initiatives to improve education, health, and well-being for underserved communities.
Reaching for the stars is tough as it is, but to reach for something unprecedented, yeah, that takes courage. Anchor Delon Dillard introduces you to Victor Glover, destined to become the first black man to orbit the moon. One. Reaching for the stars is tough as it is. And lift off of Artemis One, back to the moon and beyond. But it's far more difficult to reach for something you've never seen someone else do. Yet somehow, Victor Glover is doing it. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Space is such a unique, interestingly complex thing to do well. Standing on the shoulders of legends like Mae Jameson, Guy Bluford, and Texas's own Bernard Harris, Glover is headed to space. But this time specifically, he'll be the first black man to fly around the moon. It's bittersweet, it really truly is, because I'm excited, you know, my grandparents are excited, my parents are excited, but I also think, you know, it's 2024. It'll be 2025, and that's the first time. Glover will be the pilot on the Artemis II as it blasts into space late 2025. Alongside his three colleagues, Reed Wiseman, Christina Cox, and Canadian Space Agency astronaut Jeremy Hansen, it will be NASA's first human-crewed lunar mission since Apollo. 10-day mission around the moon to prove out the systems on the Orion spacecraft with humans on board so that our friends and colleagues can go work on the surface of the moon and around the moon in Artemis 3 and beyond. Here's Victor Glover. Glover, who was already the first black man to live on the International Space Station long term, never had dreams of being an astronaut or even a pilot at a young age. It wasn't until college when he met one of the only black faculty members on campus at California Polytechnic State. He's passed away since Carl Wallace, Dr. Carl Wallace. He had on the Navy uniform. He was a reserve captain, which is the rank I am now. But as soon as I saw him, that, that gap in my knowledge went away. That power of exposure led to Glover obtaining three engineering-related master's degrees. When you hear people say, what you see is what you be, in a sense, what you saw is what you ultimately became, do you, do you hope that you can be the same for someone else, someone else seeing you and believing in Oh, absolutely. You know, I think it's important for people to be able to dream in all colors. And now today, he's training to fly to space. We are all on this planet, all of equal value, and if the eight billion of us want to have a chance of surviving and thriving here, we've got to learn to work together. And we, like this international collaboration led by the United States and NASA, is a shining example saying to humanity, look, we can work together. Delon Dillard, Fox 26 News. When this Fox 26 celebration of Black History Month continues, we introduce you to another trailblazer whose childhood dream of becoming a lawyer turned into a remarkable reality and much more.
In celebration of Black History Month, Rebuilding Together Houston is repairing Douglas Goosby's home in Third Ward. And Fox 26 is proud to be a part of that effort. Volunteers replaced siding and front porch boards, did some painting, landscaping, and overall cleanup. And so many black leaders have defied odds and paved the way for future generations. And tonight, anchor Denise Middleton highlights a woman who broke barriers, becoming the first African-American woman appointed to the U.S. Immigration Court. When I was a little girl, my dad used to call me mouthpiece. So what does that tell you? Judge Clarice Yates dreamed of becoming a lawyer as a child growing up in Philadelphia. You know, that was a, the dream as a kid, but um, that became a reality because there wasn't any reason I couldn't do it. A first-generation college student, Yates was determined to achieve greatness, earning both her bachelor's degree and Juris Doctorate from Temple University. But not everyone believed her childhood dream would come to fruition. While in undergrad school, Yates recalls a time she asked a professor to write a letter of recommendation. I read it, and he said I was a wonderful young lady. I was smart, but not, not law school material because I couldn't think like a lawyer. That was devastating to me. And the criticism didn't stop there. I've had several people say that, you know, no, that I should be a social worker. That law school wasn't for me. Judge Yates credits her mother and teachers for motivating her to pursue her career. She went on to become an attorney for the United States International Trade Commission and administrative law judge in Washington, D.C., before making her mark in Houston in 1990 when she was appointed the first African-American immigration judge in the United States. I feel that it's a blessing. It's a blessing because it didn't have to turn out like this. Because I love my job. I've loved my job for years. I love interacting with the people. I love interacting with the children. But Yates is much more than a judge. She's a wife, mother, community activist, certified image consultant, and author. She also served as a professor at Thurgood Marshall School of Law at TSU. As a leader in the community, Clarice Yates holds many awards and honors. She's even helped raise funds for sickle cell research and was instrumental in making Texas Children's Hospital's research center what it is today. Now, after a triumphant career, she's ready to step aside and let the next generation lead the way. And I think now's the time for the younger people to come in and take over. I just want to now spend more time at home with him and family too. Just taking it easy or doing things together, having time, not having to rush, not having to pigeonhole them into a place, but just free. I want to be free. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> Denise Middleton, Fox 26 News. I'm Anthony Antoine, and thank you so much for joining me here this evening. We have so many more personal stories celebrating Black History Month online and streaming on our Fox local app for your smart TV. There you can also hear from some of our on-air personalities about what Black History Month means to them. Good night.